Welcome back, cybersecurity enthusiasts. If you're preparing for the CISSP exam, you're in the right place. Today, we're diving into part one of our CISSP practice question series. In this video, we'll be covering three critical domains. Domain one, security and risk management. Domain two, asset security. And domain three, security architecture and engineering. We'll tackle three challenging questions from each domain to help you sharpen your knowledge and boost your confidence for the exam. Let's get started. Before we jump into the questions, here's a quick overview of what each domain covers. Domain one, security and risk management. This domain focuses on the foundational concepts of security, risk management, and governance. It includes topics like security policies, risk analysis, and compliance. Domain two, asset security. Here, you'll learn about the protection of information and assets throughout their life cycle. This includes data classification, ownership, and privacy considerations. Domain three, security, architecture, and engineering. This domain dives into the principles of security design and architecture. It covers concepts like secure system design, cryptography, and security models. Now that we have an understanding of what each domain entails, let's tackle some practice questions. As the newly appointed CISO of a multinational financial institution, you discover that the organization has a fragmented risk management strategy. Each regional office follows its own policies, leading to inconsistencies and gaps in risk coverage. Recently, a regional office experienced a data breach due to inadequate risk controls, causing significant financial and reputational damage. You have been tasked with developing a unified risk management framework that complies with various international regulations and addresses the identified gaps. What steps should you take to develop and implement this unified risk management framework? Here are the options. Option A, conduct a comprehensive risk assessment of all regional offices and develop a standardized risk management policy that each office must follow. Option B, implement a centralized risk management team that monitors and enforces compliance across all regional offices, ensuring uniformity in risk management practices. Option C, Develop a risk management framework that allows customization based on regional regulations and business practices while maintaining core principles. Option D. Focus on the most critical regions with higher risks, implement standardized policies there first, and gradually roll out to other regions. To understand and answer the question correctly, Read the question, read the option, and then reread the question. Now, let us evaluate each option to find the correct answer. Option A identifies specific risks and gaps in each regional office and establishes a consistent approach to risk management. However, this option may not fully accommodate regional regulatory variations as it can be challenging to enforce a one-size-fits-all policy globally. Option B, provides consistent oversight and enforcement of risk management practices and facilitates centralized reporting and accountability. However, this option can be resource-intensive and may face resistance from regional offices due to perceived loss of autonomy. Option C, balances consistency with the flexibility needed for regional differences and ensures compliance with local regulations while adhering to overarching risk management principles. This option can be complex to develop and implement and requires robust communication and coordination across regions. Option D prioritizes regions with the highest risks, potentially reducing immediate threats, and allows for phased implementation, making the process more manageable. This option leaves other regions vulnerable in the interim, which may result in inconsistencies if the rollout is not well coordinated. 
considering the pros and cons of all the options provided. The best answer would be option C, as this approach ensures a unified framework while accommodating regional differences, essential for a multinational financial institution, and balances the need for consistency with regulatory compliance and practical implementation across diverse regions. Let us now move on to our next question. Your organization, a global e-commerce company, is facing increased scrutiny from regulators regarding data protection practices. A recent internal audit revealed that the company's incident response plan is outdated and does not account for new data protection laws. Additionally, there have been multiple instances of data breaches due to inadequate incident handling. You have been assigned to update and enhance the incident response plan to ensure regulatory compliance and improve incident handling. Which actions should you prioritize to address these issues effectively? Here are your options. Option A. Conduct a gap analysis to identify deficiencies in the current incident response plan and update it to align with new data protection laws. Option B. Implement advanced monitoring tools to detect and respond to incidents more quickly. Option C. Provide comprehensive incident response training to all employees and conduct regular drills to ensure readiness. Option D. Establish a dedicated incident response team responsible for managing all incidents and ensuring compliance with data protection laws. Let us now analyze each of the options to find the best fit. Option A. Identifies specific areas where the current plan falls short and ensures the updated plan complies with new data protection laws which addresses both strategic and tactical gaps in the incident response process. However, this option is a time-consuming process that requires thorough analysis and might delay immediate improvements in incident handling capabilities. Option B. Enhances the organization's ability to detect incidents in real time, which improves response times and mitigates the impact of data breaches. However, this option does not address strategic gaps in the incident response plan and requires significant investment in technology and training, which may not ensure compliance with data protection laws if underlying policies are outdated. Option C ensures that employees are prepared to respond effectively to incidents and conducts. Regular drills reinforce learning and identify potential weaknesses. This option does not address deficiencies in the incident response plan itself and may not ensure regulatory compliance if the plan is outdated. Option D, centralizes incident management, improving coordination and consistency, and ensures a specialized focus on incident response and regulatory compliance. However, this option does not directly address gaps in the current incident response plan and also requires additional resources and organizational changes. Considering the pros and cons associated with each of the options, the best answer is option A, as this approach addresses the root cause of the issues by identifying and fixing deficiencies in the incident response plan, ensures the plan is updated to comply with new data protection laws, meeting regulatory requirements and provides a foundation for other improvements, such as implementing monitoring tools, training, and establishing a dedicated incident response team. Before we move to our next question, we request your support to like this video and subscribe to our channel for more learning contents. Share this in your community. Your support keeps us encouraged to research and bring new topics on information security. Your company, a major player in the technology sector, is planning to expand its operations into several new countries. Each of these countries has different legal requirements regarding data privacy and security. As the head of security, you must develop a strategy that ensures compliance with local laws while maintaining a consistent level of security across all operations. What approach should you take to develop this strategy?
The options are Option A. Create a global security policy that includes specific sections for each country's legal requirements. Option B. Develop a flexible security framework that allows local adaptation while maintaining core security standards. Option C. Focus on the most stringent legal requirements and apply them universally across all operations. Option D. Assign a local security officer in each country to ensure compliance with local laws and coordinate with the central security team. Now, let us try to explore and understand each option. Option A. Ensures all country-specific legal requirements are explicitly addressed and provides clear guidance for each country's compliance needs. However, this can become overly complex and difficult to manage as the number of countries increases and may lead to inconsistencies in policy enforcement across different regions. While this approach is thorough, it may not be practical for maintaining a consistent level of security across all operations. It can be cumbersome and might lead to fragmented security practices. Option B ensures a consistent level of security across all operations while allowing flexibility to meet local legal requirements and promotes adaptability and responsiveness to changing laws and regulations in different countries. However, it requires careful design to balance flexibility with the enforcement of core standards. This approach strikes a balance between global consistency and local compliance. It allows the core security principles to remain intact while providing the necessary flexibility to meet specific legal requirements. This is the most effective and scalable solution for ensuring both compliance and security. Option C simplifies the compliance process by applying a single standard globally and ensures the highest level of security across all operations, but may be unnecessarily restrictive in countries with less stringent requirements and can lead to increased costs and operational inefficiencies. While applying the most stringent requirements globally ensures high security, it may not be cost-effective or efficient. It could impose unnecessary burdens on operations in countries with less stringent laws, leading to potential resistance and operational challenges. Option D. Provides local expertise and ensures compliance with specific legal requirements and facilitates coordination between local and central security efforts. However, this can lead to inconsistencies in security practices across different regions and may require significant resources to manage and coordinate multiple local officers. While having local security officers can be beneficial for ensuring compliance, it may result in fragmented security practices and inconsistency. Effective coordination and communication between local officers and the central team can be challenging, leading to potential gaps in security. With the said considerations, the best approach would be Option B as it allows for a consistent and robust security framework that can be adapted to meet local legal requirements. This ensures both compliance and the maintenance of high security standards across all operations, making it the most practical and scalable solution. Let us now move on to our next question. Your organization is undergoing a significant restructuring and several departments are being consolidated. This restructuring includes merging the IT and security departments of two previously independent business units. Each unit has its own data classification and handling policies. You need to integrate these policies into a unified framework that ensures the protection of sensitive data while maintaining operational efficiency. How should you approach the integration of data classification and handling policies? Your options are Option A. Conduct a thorough review of both units' policies and create a new unified policy that incorporates the best practices from each. Option B. Adopt the more stringent of the two policies and apply it across the newly merged department. Option C. Develop a hybrid policy that combines elements from both units' policies 
and ensures compliance with regulatory requirements. Option D, implement a phased approach where each unit's policies are gradually aligned over time to minimize disruption. Let us try to understand the pros and cons of each option. Option A, utilizes strengths of both policies, promotes a comprehensive and balanced approach, and facilitates buy-in from both units, but is time and resource intensive. This approach is the most thorough and balanced, ensuring that the unified policy is well-rounded and incorporates effective practices from both units. It promotes collaboration and reduces the likelihood of overlooking critical aspects of data protection, making it the best choice for long-term success and operational efficiency. Option B, simplifies integration and ensures high data protection but may lead to potential operational inefficiencies and possible resistance from one unit. While adopting the more stringent policy ensures strong data protection, it may not be the most efficient approach. This method could lead to operational challenges and resistance from the affected unit, potentially hindering the integration process. Option C. Balances needs of both units and ensures regulatory compliance but is complex to integrate different elements and may lead to inconsistencies or gaps. While this approach aims to balance both units' needs by creating a hybrid policy, it can be difficult to integrate different elements seamlessly. Ensuring consistency and completeness in the new policy can be challenging, which might lead to potential gaps in data protection. Option D minimizes immediate disruption and allows time for adjustment, but prolongs the integration process and increases the risks of inconsistent practices during the transition. A phased approach minimizes immediate disruption, but prolongs the integration process, leading to potential inconsistencies and vulnerabilities. This method delays the benefits of having a unified policy, which can impact the overall effectiveness of data protection efforts. With this understanding, the best approach would be option A, as it ensures a comprehensive and balanced integration of both units' data classification and handling policies. By conducting a thorough review and incorporating best practices from each unit, the new unified policy will be well-rounded, efficient, and effective in protecting sensitive data while maintaining operational efficiency. This method promotes collaboration and reduces the risk of overlooking critical aspects of data protection, making it the most sustainable and practical solution. Let us now move on to our next question. As the security lead for a large manufacturing company, you are responsible for securing sensitive design and production data. Recently, your company decided to partner with several third-party vendors for certain aspects of production. This decision has raised concerns about the security of data shared with these vendors. You need to establish a data protection strategy that ensures the security of sensitive information while working with third-party vendors. What measures should you implement to secure sensitive data when working with third-party vendors? The options are Option A. Require all third-party vendors to adhere to your company's data protection policies. Option B. Implement strict access controls and data encryption for all data shared with vendors. Option C. Conduct regular security audits of third-party vendors to ensure compliance with data protection standards. Option D. Develop comprehensive data protection agreements with vendors that include access controls, encryption, and regular audits. Let us now explore each option to find the best fit. Option A. Ensures vendors follow your data protection standards, but might not address all specific security needs or compliance issues unique to each vendor. Requiring vendors to adhere to your company's data protection policies ensures a consistent standard, but may lack customization for specific risks and may not cover all compliance needs specific to the vendors. Option B, provides robust protection of data in transit and at rest, 
but doesn't address ongoing compliance and security posture of vendors. Implementing access controls and encryption secures the data directly, but does not ensure ongoing compliance or address other aspects of the vendor's overall security posture. Option C verifies vendor compliance and identifies vulnerabilities, but doesn't proactively define how data should be protected from the outset. Conducting regular audits ensures vendors maintain compliance and helps identify vulnerabilities, but doesn't provide upfront measures for data protection. Option D, combines proactive and reactive measures, ensuring initial and ongoing data security compliance, making it the most thorough approach. Developing comprehensive data protection agreements is the most effective measure as it combines access controls, encryption, and regular audits. This ensures data protection from the start and maintains security and compliance over time. With this understanding, the best approach would be Option D, as it establishes a thorough data protection strategy by combining access controls, encryption, and regular audits into comprehensive agreements with vendors. This ensures both initial and ongoing security and compliance, making it the most robust and effective solution for protecting sensitive data when working with third-party vendors. Let us now move on to our next question. Your organization is transitioning from on-premises data storage to a cloud-based solution. As the information security manager, you need to ensure that the migration process does not compromise data security. The cloud service provider offers several security features, but it is your responsibility to define the security controls that must be implemented. What steps should you take to ensure the security of data during and after the migration to the cloud? The options are Option A. Encrypt all data before migration and ensure it remains encrypted in the cloud. Option B. Develop a comprehensive data security strategy that includes encryption, access controls, and monitoring. Option C. Conduct a risk assessment of the cloud service provider and implement the recommended security controls. Option D. Implement multi-factor authentication for all users accessing the cloud-based data. Let us now review each option carefully. Option A. This step ensures data confidentiality during and after migration, but does not address access control, monitoring, or other security aspects. Encrypting data before and after migration is crucial for maintaining confidentiality. However, this approach alone does not provide a complete security strategy as it lacks access control and monitoring components. Option B provides a holistic approach by covering encryption for confidentiality, access controls for restricting data access, and monitoring for detecting and responding to security incidents. A comprehensive data security strategy is the most effective as it encompasses all necessary security measures, including encryption, access controls, and continuous monitoring. This ensures data is protected from unauthorized access and potential threats both during and after migration. Option C. Identifies potential risks and appropriate controls, but may not cover all necessary aspects, such as ongoing monitoring and user access management. Conducting a risk assessment is vital for understanding potential vulnerabilities and implementing recommended controls. However, this step alone is insufficient without incorporating a broader security strategy that includes encryption, access controls, and monitoring. Option D, enhances user authentication security, but does not address data encryption, access control policies, or continuous monitoring. Implementing multi-factor authentication, MFA, is essential for strengthening user access security. Nonetheless, relying solely on MFA is not enough to ensure comprehensive data security during and after migration, as it does not cover encryption or monitoring. Having reviewed all the options, the best fit for this scenario would be option B, as this is the best approach 
which provides a comprehensive data security strategy that includes encryption, access controls, and monitoring. This holistic approach ensures that data is protected from unauthorized access and potential threats during and after the migration to the cloud, addressing all critical aspects of data security. Let us now move on to our next question. You are leading the security architecture team for a new financial application being developed by your organization. This application will handle sensitive customer data and financial transactions. During the initial design phase, you realize that the development team is prioritizing functionality over security. There is pressure from upper management to meet aggressive deadlines, which may lead to security being compromised. How should you proceed to ensure that security is integrated into the application development process without significantly delaying the project? Your options are Option A. Conduct a security risk assessment to identify critical security requirements and work with the development team to integrate these into the current project timeline. Option B. Implement security checkpoints in the development lifecycle to ensure that security considerations are addressed at each stage. Option C. Develop a minimum security baseline that must be met before the application can be released and conduct thorough security testing before deployment. Option D. Work with upper management to adjust project deadlines, emphasizing the importance of security in the financial application. Let us review the rationale for each option. Option A. Balances security needs with project timelines by identifying and prioritizing critical security requirements, integrating them into the current development schedule without causing significant delays. Conducting a security risk assessment helps identify the most critical security requirements that need immediate attention. By working closely with the development team, these requirements can be integrated into the project timeline ensuring security is not overlooked while keeping the project on track. Option B, ensures ongoing security integration, but may introduce delays at each checkpoint, impacting overall project timelines. Security checkpoints throughout the development lifecycle ensure that security is consistently addressed. However, this method could introduce delays at each stage potentially impacting the aggressive project deadlines. Option C, ensures a security standard is met before release, but may delay the project if security issues are discovered late in the development process. Creating a minimum security baseline ensures that critical security measures are in place before the application is released. However, Thorough security testing at the end of the development cycle can uncover issues that might require significant rework, causing project delays. Option D. Addresses security concerns but may not be feasible due to upper management's focus on meeting deadlines, risking project delays and potential pushback. Adjusting project deadlines to prioritize security emphasizes its importance but may not be feasible given upper management's pressure to meet aggressive deadlines. This approach could lead to resistance and further complications. With this review, we can now saw that option A is the best approach as it balances the need for security with the project's aggressive timelines. By conducting a security risk assessment and working with the development team, you can identify and prioritize critical security requirements ensuring they are integrated into the current project timeline. This method helps maintain project momentum while addressing essential security concerns, making it the most practical and effective solution. Let us now move on to our next question. Your organization is designing a new network architecture to support a highly distributed workforce. This architecture must ensure secure access to corporate resources from various locations, including home offices and public networks. The security team is considering implementing a zero-trust model to address these requirements. 
However, there are concerns about the complexity and potential impact on user experience. What should be your primary considerations when implementing a zero-trust model in this scenario? Here are your options. Option A. Ensure robust identity and access management, IAM controls, including multi-factor authentication, MFA, and continuous monitoring. Option B. Implement network segmentation and micro-segmentation to minimize the attack surface. Option C. Develop a user education program to ensure employees understand the importance of zero trust principles and how to adhere to them. Option D. Balance security controls with user experience by conducting pilot tests and gathering feedback to refine the implementation. Let us evaluate each option to find the best approach. Option A. Crucial for verifying user identities and monitoring access but focusing solely on IAM might overlook other aspects like user experience and network architecture. Implementing robust IAM controls is essential for a zero-trust model, as it ensures that only authenticated and authorized users can access resources. However, focusing exclusively on IAM without considering user experience and network design might lead to user frustration and reduced productivity. Option B, reduces the attack surface by isolating network segments, but might add complexity and impact user experience if not balanced properly. Network segmentation and micro-segmentation are effective in minimizing the attack surface by isolating different parts of the network. While this enhances security, it can also introduce complexity and affect user experience if not implemented carefully. Option C, ensures employee understanding and compliance, but education alone does not address technical implementation and user experience. Educating users about zero trust principles is vital for compliance and security awareness. However, focusing solely on education without addressing the technical implementation and its impact on user experience may not be sufficient for a successful rollout. Option D ensures a balanced approach by addressing both security and user experience through iterative testing and feedback. Balancing security controls with user experience is crucial for the successful implementation of a zero-trust model. Conducting pilot tests allows for identifying and addressing potential issues before a full rollout, ensuring that the implementation is secure without significantly impacting user experience. Considering all the pros and cons, the best approach would be option D, as it ensures a balanced and practical implementation of the zero trust model by addressing both security requirements and user experience. Conducting pilot tests and gathering feedback helps refine the implementation, making it more user friendly while maintaining strong security controls. This method promotes a smooth transition to a zero-trust architecture, accommodating the needs of a highly distributed workforce. Let us now move on to our next question. That's it for part one of our CISSP practice question series. We hope these questions helped you feel more prepared for the CISSP exam. Remember, practice makes perfect. Keep testing your knowledge, and you'll be ready to tackle the exam with confidence. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you never miss out on more CISSP practice questions and study tips. Stay tuned for part two, where we'll cover the next set of domains. Until next time, stay safe and keep learning.